Episode 80 of the Interpretation Station is called to order. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you were watching episode 79, I trust you were, you'll have noticed uh, that the old gaveling went a bit more smoothly this time around. If you haven't watched episode 79, go and watch it now and you'll see what I'm talking about. Whew. Anyway, I don't think my, mother's gonna, my mother-in-law won't kill me this time like she did for episode 79. We're going to do a bit, something a bit different uh, today, everyone. Now, as you know, if you've been watching a lot, plenty, lots of epi- uh, interpretation stations shows, um, I usually tend to stick to uh, looking at texts going uh, into English, you know, from French, Russian, Spanish. That's because uh, at, my, um, at the UN, that's just how the, uh, the booths are set up. And uh, most, you know, most of the interpreters there work into their native tongue. Um, the difference being uh, the Chinese and Arabic booths, who they need to have uh, a retour. I technically do have a retour. I have a sort of B, I have a B in Serbian, but I haven't used that in a very, uh, very long time. However, I thought it would be interesting to take a look as to how one of you guys, a non-English A, um, whose mother tongue is something other than English, uh, how you would approach text in English going into your native tongue. Like I say, I have had I have had experience in it before doing this before, long time ago. Also, um, one thing I like to practice, say, you know, in English booth, sometimes there are times when uh, things are pretty quiet, meetings all in English and you've got nothing much to do. Sometimes in my head to practice, I like to imagine, to think what I'd like to say in Spanish. Uh, or Russian. It's good practice, by the way. Um, so it's not so so that you're not just sitting there, you know, the whole meeting just uh, to get keep your mind working to keep the uh, the grey cells greased. I sometimes, you know, it's good in your half hour, for example. Just think, okay, what would I say here in 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 Russian? Go over it in your head, and it makes you look at also for you know the techniques that you need to use if you're going from English into another language, because there are certain shortcuts that English speakers will use, not even deliberate shortcuts, I'm saying delegates, you know, with use of acronyms and things that you need to know how to handle when you're going into your native tongue. For example, in French, it seems to me that it's slightly frowned upon almost to use acronyms. So how do you get around that? When the English speaker, we English speakers, we love to use acronyms. We use acronyms all the time. Uh, How, if you're interpreting into French, are you going to create those shortcuts, how are you going to keep up with the original speaker without having to say the full name of the organization or a treaty or whatever instrument every time? What little tricks are there that allow you to uh, to keep up with the, the English speaker? So like I said, I'm not going to focus on going into any specific language. You, I may refer to French or Spanish alternatives simply because I think those are the uh, the languages that the, the majority of you know other th- than English, so I may sort of refer to them at times. Um, to sort of set the scene for you, what we're going to look at, it's the, the statements I've taken, they're all from the same meeting. And that meeting was in March 2021, 11th of March 2021. It was an interactive dialogue with the Commission of Inquiry on the situation in Syria. Now, the Commission had submitted... Uh, two reports on that situation. Um, you'd had the rapporteurs, had, the, two rapport, the rapporteurs had already spoken and introduced the topic and everything. And now it's on to the delegations to make their contributions, to make their sort of comments on, on, on what they've heard. So I've taken a, a handful of statements here in English of slightly different, um, from a different selection of styles, okay? Uh, the first one I've gone for, we'll go one by one. I'm, so we're going to look for each one. We're going to look at how would I, I would approach sort of psychologically a, a interpreting a statement by that delegation. What, you know, try and predict what some of the pitfalls are going to be. Um, and also think about the style that that delegation, for example, will be speaking in and how to cope with that style. So, you know, um, a lot of the vocabulary that we're going to be using, it's, it's going to be repeated throughout the statements. But that's, a, that's a good thing. You know, if you're going to be working uh, in political issues, international organizations, the media, an issue like Syria is going gonna, is, is gonna to come up a lot. So you do need to really know uh, the vocabulary um, for, on that issue. And so this will be a good exercise in seeing how, as I say, you would approach, how you would basically... Um, 
interpret these English statements into your own native tongues. So the first uh, statement that we're going to use, uh, it's by the European Union. Now, I like statements by the European Union because they tend to be very to the point. They tend to be very meticulously prepared. They'll draw on, they, you know, usually they will be in English. They'll draw on lots of uh, the vocabulary that's uh, in the big resolutions, for example. And the formulations they use will be very stock formulations, ones that are really actually good to remember almost off by heart. Uh, in fact, if I end up in a meeting, if I come into a meeting sort of cold, I'm not too certain uh, what the main vocabulary is, one of the first things I'll do is look, I'll see if I can find the EU text, just have a quick read of it, and that will give me the main pointers. It'll give me the sort of, as I say, the important vocabulary, the important organizations, the important linguistic formulations, if you like. They're very good. The EU statements are very good in terms of being a sort of just a guide, a reference point for what a meeting is about. They tend to be very, very business-like statements. They, do, they don't, because I guess the majority of the EU speakers, they're not native English speakers. They won't go wander off too, too much, make, you know, into literary flights of fancy like you'll see native speakers might. They tend to very much stick to the point, stick to the uh, the standard formulations, okay? So I'm going to share my screen with you here, and we're going to see what the EU had to say then uh, for this in response to the presentation of these two reports and to see how we would um, deal with it. Now, I've actually marked up some of these texts. Uh, I'm going to let you into a secret. I've, I, I, I filmed this already earlier this morning, and I thought I'd saved it, and I hadn't saved it. And it, all my, one hour of work was went complete was completely wasted. So this is my second attempt. So this statement's all marked up. So uh, let's see. Uh, I'm full, keeping my fingers crossed that uh, it records it successfully this time. Okay. Oh, one very quick thing at the start. Then here you'll see, uh, Madam President. I've crossed out the Madam. Uh, and lots of these meetings on, that have been remote that we've been doing in the last year or so, they're remote. Often you get dropped into a meeting and you, don't, you can't see who the, the chair, who's sitting on the podium, who's present. You know, they're sitting halfway around the, on the other side of the world. So to prevent any confusion with the gender of the president, I'll often just say president. Because sometimes maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a vice, maybe the president is a woman, but maybe it's the vice president who's presiding over the meeting. So what are you going to call him, madam? No, that sounds a bit... Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, now, I've underlined here the commission of inquiry. Why well, have I underlined the commission of inquiry? Well, there's a good chance that by this point you've had the reports presented that, and now you've got the delegations that they're just going to refer to it immediately as the COI. So it's a, but this commission of inquiry, that is the standard acronym for it, and it gets used a lot. What's more, uh, this mechanism, a commission of inquiry. They're going to use something similar, I believe, for the situation in Palestine. This is obviously a favored tool now for mm, investigating situations of concern around the world. So you've got to be prepared if you hear the COI that you know that it's a commission of inquiry and uh, deal with it accordingly. And which brings me another th thing. As I say, if you sit in French, for example, okay, the, the word for this in French, the expression for this and commission d'enquête. Now, the French, though I've never heard them use, the French speakers, I've never heard them use uh, le CDE, le CDE, sorry, le, or le CE. They don't really use the, the acronym. It's usually, they just say the commission d'enquête. Now, what you can do is that when they mention the commission of inquiry the next time round, rather than having to say la commission d'enquête, you can just refer to them as la commission. Okay, we, we know it's already been presented, we know who they are, so that's one way of getting around it, okay? You just refer to them later as la commission, it's, and it saves you a little bit of time, that little bit of time could be important. Okay, my next paragraph here, now this is what I mean about the EU using these sort of set formulations, these uh, from like resolutions and things. Uh, persistent, widespread, systematic, serious violations, you know, these all these adjectives all come as a bit of a package. Now, the thing with adjectives is they're a bit expendable. So when you get a, if you, uh, let's pretend you haven't got this text and you hear this string of four adjectives being 
coming at you. I think it's perfectly reasonable if you can get two out of four, for example, I think that's acceptable. Three out of four is very good. Four, or four, four out of four is ideal, but uh, I don't think anyone's going to kill you if you only get two or three. So, you know, again, it all just depends on the moment, how fast the speaker's speaking, etc. But those are, but these are all good collocations that go with violations and abuses, these four adjectives. Widespread, persistent, systematic, and serious. Now, another package, another common package, certainly that, that you'll hear in these situations where there have been lots of human rights violations, are violations and abuses of human rights. They really do go together like bacon and eggs, honestly. You know, you, uh, it's not... I, I, and it's, it's, it's not like violations and affronts to human rights or, or something like violations and contraventions of human rights. You know, it's a really specific set phrase, violations and abuses. So you should find out what the equivalent is in your own uh, native language. International humanitarian law. Next one. This is a tricky one because, again, in English, sometimes we'll go, the English speakers will say IHL. That's quite a common and accepted acronym to use. So be prepared for that, okay? And often international humanitarian law, it comes in a package with international human rights law, which you'll be glad to hear doesn't tend to use an acronym, and also refugee law, you'll find. Those three often come together in a package. The, the, here again, violations and abuses going together. Constitute crimes against humanity, war crimes. So this, you'll, this constitute, you'll hear also, uh, could amount to, could be tantamount to, so those are other ones for you just to listen out to, which all more or less mean the same thing. This is a very good standard phrase to know also. Abide by their obligations. Make sure you, in your language you have a phrase that you're comfortable with dropping in for, for this, to abide by their obligations. I use this a lot when I'm interpreting from other languages. You know, when I hear in other languages, conformer avec leurs obligations, or cumplir con sus obligaciones. Uh, to abide by their obligations, okay? You'll also hear, yeah, to, uh, to comply with. I sometimes use comply with more, and I'll tell you why. The good thing with comply is that comply also goes into the noun, that you have compliance, okay? The funny thing with abide is that abide doesn't really have a noun equivalent. There's no abidance or abidement. Uh, abide by sounds nicer than comply with, um, but I sometimes tend to just favor comply because of that. It's got that slight bit of that element of flexibility. But anyway, so just make sure you've got a couple of, of equivalents in your own native tongues that you can immediately use. Now, we've got a lot of set phrases in this next paragraph. Arbitrarily detained. So the whole concept of arbitrary detention. There's not really much. Uh, you need to find out what the specific expression for that is, again, in your native tongue forcibly disappeared. So that again refers to another set, set concept, enforced disappearance. Find out in your language, how do you say enforced disappearance? Okay, this is a slight twist on it because it t turns the disappear into a, into a verb. But find out what the set phrase for enforced disappearance is. And then again, lots of design torture and ill treatment. Um, There's a very important one, sexual and gender-based violence. Another acronym you'll hear sometimes dropped in is GBV, gender-based violence. You might, they might not use it the first time. They'll probably give you the, you know, the full name the first time, gender-based violence. But again, uh, English-speaking de English delegates, they like, we like speaking acronyms when, when we can. And they'll often just go straight into GBV. Or you'll also hear SGBV. If you hear SGBV, sexual and gender-based violence. So yeah, you get these weird acronyms in English. I'm sorry, guys. That's just how we English speakers are. Okay, I'm going to move down to the next, the final, or the next paragraph here. This is a very important uh, phrase to have an equivalent for in your language. Referred to the International Criminal Court. Now, I say this is very important because, for example, in certain languages, I know in French, for example, they talk about la saisine de la tribunal international. Uh, which is one that can throw you if you're going into English. You hear seizing and you start thinking of saying seized, f seizing the, the court. But the, the set expression in English is referred to the International Criminal Court. So make sure that in your language you know what the um, the equivalent is. Again, in French it's very it's very specifically different. La saisir le, le tribunal international. In some languages it might be more similar to the English referred, but. Uh, as I say, make sure you know that. 
and also the International Criminal Court. We will frequently call it the ICC. Again, frequently without dropping into, uh, you know, without giving the full name first. We'll just hope that, you know, that's what that's, you're expected to know what the ICC is, International Criminal Court. Actually, in, in, so in French, for example, the, 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 the International Criminal Court translates as Le Cour Pénal International. I must admit, you do occasionally hear Le CPI. It's not unheard of for the French to use the acronym there. So I think, at least if you're going to French, uh, you, you could probably get away with that. Okay, now we're going to the second page of this uh, of this statement by the EU. Now, again, in the context of the Syrian situation, you have what's called the triple IM. That's what the English speakers will sometimes refer to as the triple IM. And the full name, I always forget which order the words come in. I'm going to take a guess. I think it's the Independent Impartial Investigative Mechanism. Ah, I was wrong. It's the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism. Okay. So once again, in, in the English, you'll sometimes you'll just hear three IM. So don't be caught off guard. Make sure you're prepared for that. Uh, this here is a very important organization. I haven't underlined it for some reason. Let's, have a, let's give it an underline. OPCW, the, operation, the Organization for the Pro Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Uh, this actually is sometimes, this is extremely important in the context of Syria, because that's the organization that is mandated to oversee the uh, elimination of the Syri Syrian chemical weapons arsenal. So you'll hear them referred to a lot, uh, at least in French. I mean, Oyak, Oyak, I think I have heard used quite a bit. But again, make sure you know that and you know what the equivalent is in your language. Uh, this is again. This is probably typical. This is like typical resolution language. These all these adjectives: complete, immediate, nationwide ceasefire, uh, unhindered, safe, and sustained humanitarian access. For unhindered access, sometimes you'll hear in English unimpeded, unfettered. Uh, so they all mean pretty much the same thing. Okay, just be on. Just be aware that you might. It might not always be unhindered, but one of these other two that I give you. Cross-border access. Again, guess what? It's a very important concept. Uh, what's very important uh, in the context of Syria is to distinguish between the notions of cross-border access and cross-line access. It's not the same thing. They're different. Cross-border means humanitarian access that is coming from another country, be it from Turkey or, or Iraq, generally, uh, are the two sources of that access. Cross-line assistance, on the other hand, is the... Uh, the um, assistance that comes via the front lines where the actual two sides are sort of faced off against each other and that's a very important difference okay so make sure you know in your again in your language what the two equivalents are again here's another to another torrent of adjectives comprehensive genuine and inclusive political transition you know again with when you have this sort of string of three two you probably want to be trying getting two out of the three anyway you, you know you don't have to get them all, but it's good to get a couple of those adjectives out. Uh, and this is obviously the, the big resolution when it comes to Syria, 2254. If you know you're going to be working on a meeting in Syria, uh, my advice to you is to meet before. Look it up. Look the resolution up. Look at all the wording it, uh, they use. Look at all the sort of buzz phrases. And you'll be well. And if you, you, know, if you do that, you'll be, it'll set you in very good store for the upcoming uh, meeting. Okay, we're going to go to the second text now. And now, this, as I said, I said with, with the, the EU, they tend to be very business like. Uh, they keep things pretty straightforward. Um, they don't veer too much from the substance of the matter. Now, we're going to look at the, the next one. We're going to look at a native speaking delegation, native English speaking delegation in the UK. And they're a bit of a different, they're a bit of a slightly different beast. And I'll tell you why. So with the UK, then to find, I think you've got two, all, all t two different styles uh, to expect from the UK. Now, in a meeting like this, it's, it's an important meeting. So the main ambassador, the permanent representative, is likely to be there. And he's probably going to write his own statements. Uh, and you know what these British, dipl you know, British diplomats are like, you know, Oxford education, probably went to Eton Harrow. Uh, they're very well-read guys, 
you know, all these statements that are a bit of a chance for them to show off their knowledge of the English language. So you're probably going to run into certain expressions that are pretty literary. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of uh, channeling their inner Charles Dickens sometimes. So you've got to watch out for that. And you've got to be prepared. You do, mustn't fall into the trap of trying to copy them. Often with that sort of style, the best thing to do is just to keep it again simple, just to ensure that you're getting the meaning across. Now, the other kind of UK statement you're likely to hear are those that have probably been written in Whitehall and have been sort of faxed down to the, uh, the minions somewhere in Geneva or wherever it happens to be, just to be read out, you know. Um, now, a lot of those statements um, that are written, you know, that I think are almost mass-produced, they, uh, they tend to be full of every cliché, uh, every mantra under the sun. Uh, the, the statements will read like one big, long... Uh, social media hashtag, put it together, because there's some more, there's a few little, of, a few, there's a few of these little literary flourishes. Um, so, as I say, we, you can see it here. And again, some of the things I've underlined. This expression here, for example, a devastating reminder. This is a very sort of English thing to say, you know. Um, in, other, in French or Spanish, you'll often use the verb more, ça nous rappelle, de, so in English we tend to go with a, re, a devastating reminder, a stark reminder, a timely reminder, a harrowing reminder, phrases like these. So the fact that we use the noun, a reminder, don't let that put you off. I mean, if, if in your language, like in French, it's, it's more natural to use a verb than use the verb, all right? Ça nous rappelle d'une manière effrayante, or whatever it may be, okay? So that's an important thing to remember when interpreting from English. Don't always follow the syntax of the English. Use syntax in your language, which sounds uh, smoothest, that sounds most natural. Here we have the violations and abuses again, all right? Uh, endured is a slightly upscale, I haven't underlined, I'll just quickly underline it. Endured for a decade. It's a slight register higher than suffer. Suffer and endure, okay, they're pretty much similar. that bit stronger. Another set phrase here, bear primary responsibility. Make sure you have a, a solution that you're comfortable with in your native language. Uh, often we talk about shouldering the resp responsibility for something also, shouldering the responsibility, bearing the responsibility. Appalling war crimes. Make sure that, again, you can... Uh, that you recognize this word, all right, appalling. This is a word I try and use a lot when I'm interpreting from wherever it may be French and into, into English. It's, it's that level, again, it's that register higher than just sort of terrible or uh, awful. Or, or awful. Maybe in French it might be the same as like épouvantable. Um, make sure anyway, the, the important thing with a word like appalling is that you know more or less um, the connotation of the word. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe that épouvantable doesn't come to you right in the moment, but at least know that, you know, terrible effectively means the same thing. This is a slightly strange choice of word by an English native speaker. Indiscriminate bombarding of civilian populated areas. Usually with, in, in English, we talk about either the bombing or the shelling. Bombing more, most, is more often than not with aerial bombing from airplanes from aircraft, where shelling tends to be from, you know, uh, surface to surface, if you like, you know, from cannons and things. Um, so bombarding seems, to me, as an English native speaker, seems a slightly strange choice of word. But again, it's important not to, to let it, you know, throw you off course. You know, there's an equivalent of that idea of bomb that can be found in pretty much every other language. So that was more just me just pointing that out to you that, that it's a, as I say, it's a strange choice of word. This is a very important phrase that you need to have an equivalent for in your language, to be held accountable. Okay, so like, you know, in, in French, they talk about reddition des comptes. Spanish, but responsabilidad, again, it's, a, it's one that comes up all the time when you're talking about conflicts and the need to make sure that the people who've carried out the crimes, that they're brought to justice or that they're held accountable. So that's, that is an expression that you must know, that you must be able to just, that must be able to just trip off the tongue. You don't want to get stuck in it. 
Now, this is, again, this is a very English sort of expression. Here. Bleakly articulates. The Commission's report bleakly articulates. Um, it's important here, as I say, not to get to disappear down that rabbit hole of trying to exactly replicate the bleakly articulates. Okay, you should know bleakly, you should have that idea of that it's bad, that things are, something's bad is going on. It's a bit like the word in French, okay, funeste. So with funeste, I mean, I know that word, I keep here, I hear it a lot. Um, and I know it's something bad, so whenever I hear it, I try and you know, I'll make sure that in the sentence that I produce, that I deliver in English, I give it that shade, I give it that shade of, of that there's something negative going on. Funnily, and funnily enough, when I was making the episode this morning, I thought I'd actually look up funest. And one of the actual alternatives it gives me was like grimly or gloomy. So I think that funest and bleakly are actually pretty good uh, solutions for each other. So there's just a, a little tip for you. So maybe at least for you French speakers, if you hear bleakly, maybe you want to throw, you want to use the word funest. But even if you don't, okay, if you're going into French, you know, okay, articule, you know, it, you know, it's talking about the impact of this conflict. You know, you want to try and. Uh, technique that we interpreters use this is i don't know you can throw in a negative sounding word somewhere later in the sentence you know over 11.5 uh, million individuals ont été déplacés malheureusement you know it, it conveys that shade of um bleakness of negativity that the uh, the speaker is trying to convey uh breaches of international humanitarian law it's always you know in english we've got a few alternatives to violations. Violations is the word that you'll hear m uh, most often, but we've got breaches, uh, contraventions you'll sometimes hear. So just be aware of those possible alternatives that we sometimes use uh, in English. Okay, so that was the UK. Now the next uh, statement we're going to look at is by non-native English speaker. And okay, so I mean the EU one was by non-native English speaker, but it was 99% there. Uh, the Japanese, they're never Sometimes their English can be a bit wonky from, from time to time. Now, the, the big challenge, of course, with a, a delegation, a speaker from Japan, is going to be the accent. In particular, uh, the use of uh, L's. Okay, In Japan, there's no L. I, I, I don't speak Japanese, but this is what I'm told. There's no letter L. And so often their L's uh, will come out sounding like R's, which uh, makes the issue of elections uh quite important quite entertaining if you like uh, yeah just think about it so that's one thing that that's one thing that's a challenge that you're going to face in the non-english booth much more than we do uh, in the english booth is trying to get a grip uh on these accents and also by extension the the, the english it's important um when uh when a speaker is is speaking English, it's not his native language. You just make sure that your French, Spanish, whatever it is, Russian, Arabic, sounds native, smooth. Don't go down this, don't try to avoid making the same grammatical mistakes that they're making in English in your own language. And that's not that, it's easier, sometimes that can be easier said than done. In the English booth, we have that sometimes when, uh, uh, for example, you have certain Spanish speakers, certain indigenous people in, in Latin America when they speak Spanish. You can tell Spanish isn't perhaps their native tongue. And so their Spanish comes up sa out sounding slightly, slightly odd. But, so the important thing is that what you say sounds clear. What have the Japanese uh, got for us here? So, so you hear, see here straight away that the Japanese go in with a COI. There's no sort of commission of inquiry to start with. They just go straight for the COI. So again, you have to be prepared for that. Uh, inception, that's a very high register word in English, actually. Inception <coughs> of the commission, of an organization, just means the same as the creation, the establishment. It's just important to recognize it. And this is a good word, heinous violations. That's a word that you're going to hear uh, often that you talk about gross violations. Um, the, the, we, so I learned this, you know, as a, as a as what my colleague Dan Harrison would call a semantic field when talking about violations. You want to have 
a sort of set of adjectives that fit nicely with the word violation. So there's like heinous, gross, dastardly, egregious. So just be prepared for any of those. Okay, then again, here we talk about international humanitarian law and human rights law are going together. Uh, here's an example of what I mean. The, the, the English isn't always 100%. We deplore ongoing dire situation in Syria at all. So just don't let it... You, you will probably think to yourself, hang on, that doesn't sound right. Um, and so just make sure, you know, just keep it simple. We deplore the, the, the ongoing dire situation in Syria. Don't try and add anything to it. You, you, you know what he's, the guy's getting at. Now, here's an interesting example. Again, all the perpetrators of human rights violations should be held accountable in a due process. Now, okay, first of all, held accountable. You need to know that, as I said before in the, in the, <coughs> the EU statement. Now, this in a due process, I'm not 100% certain what he's getting at here. I'm not certain if he wants to say should be held duly accountable or if he wants to say should be held accountable applying... You know, there's the concept of uh, due process, like in Spanish, debido proceso. Um, it's a specific legal concept in English. Now, what do you do if you run into that and you're not certain what to do? Well, to be honest, I'd say, I think you can say do it either way, okay? Um, I was using the Spanish uh, expression there, con debido proceso. Go, okay, go with that, for example. Say, you know, Make sure that the responsible con el debido proceso. So long as it sounds uh, intelligible in English, so long as it sounds in co sounds coherent, that's important. You could do it the other way as well. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, and basically you can use either or. As I say, I'm not certain specifically what the Japanese delegate is getting here, but as long as what you say sounds smooth in your native tongue, you're, you're going to be fine. All right. Going down to this paragraph here, there's a couple of interesting things. This is why this picks up on what I said earlier, but the, the difference between cross-line and cross-border assistance, okay? So the Japanese are, you know, drawing this distinction between the two. In addition to cross-line assistance, which, I rem as I said, remember, is across the lines, the front lines, you have the assistance coming from across uh, the borders. And here... I've crossed out accidentally, but uh, containing COVID-19, that's a very good, in English, that's a very good little collocation to use. You know, uh, you'll, you'll often hear us English interpreters, uh, when interpreting from other languages, talking about struggling with COVID, still grappling with COVID, trying to recover uh, from COVID, um, tussling with COVID. Really, the best thing in English to say, and full credit to the Japanese for getting it, is, is trying to contain it. Okay, um, and then you so you put that into your language, whichever collocation seems uh, mo that, again that you're most comfortable with. But that's just for actually for the the English natives. I think that's a really good word to go with COVID, trying to contain COVID, rather than getting lost and trying to say this country is still trying to recover from COVID, trying to come to terms with COVID. I'm going to start using to trying just to contain COVID. Um, I think it works very well. Now, the last statement we're going to look at is by uh, one of the UN actual organizations. Okay, so this was by uh, UN Women. And with the uh, statements delivered by UN Women or any UN entity, the chances are they're going to be using a lot of the... Um, they're going to be meticulous with the vocabulary they're going to be using. They're going to be using a lot of uh, set, set expressions, even though I think probably more meticulous... Uh, than the, the EU statements. And you want to be really trying to reflect that vocabulary. You want to capture as much of it uh, as possible. So the first thing I'd pick out here from UN Women is this expression here. I like it. To document violations. Document violations. That's just a good... It's a good one if you were to be able to recognize to know in your own language, know exactly how you say that. And also in... Uh, in English, if you're going into English, that is really the best co collocation rather than recording violations. You may be tempted to say, but to document violations. 
of women's and girls' rights. Now, this is an important concept, especially as we're talking about uh, UN women. Uh, there may be a temptation, perhaps, to just drop the girls, for example. You think you may think, okay, women's, female, uh, maybe I can drop girls. I would avoid doing that. I would make a, uh, I would, uh, make a point of uh, reflect, repeat, you know, giving, you know, ref making sure that you say the same: women's and girls' human rights in in your in your language also. And again, these are very these. The, then you have a number of these um, positions within UN Women. Um, that are pretty specific. They have pretty specific jobs: specialized investigators, gender and child rights advisors, and interpreters. I mean, I sometimes say that you know the the, the adjectives are a bit uh, expendable. Um, I mean, you could say just investigators, advisors, and interpreters, but you do want to some in that to get. You want in that to at least get some. Um, idea of the child rights at least being uh, conveyed to the listener that they're not just your run of the mill investigators advisors and interpreters but they're specifically uh, on some of these issues uh, gender or child rights uh, OHCHR so that's one thing you're going to hear all the time at least in Geneva the Human Rights Council um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights Sometimes in French for OHCHR, you will hear HCDH. Um, that is an accepted acronym. Or maybe you just when you use Le Bureau, like the Office of the High Commissioner. So that's a, you know, if that's going to be repeated a lot in a text, this notion of the uh, OHCHR, the Office of the High Commissioner. Uh, in, in French, you, can just, you could just say Le Bureau. Instrumental here, it's a nice word in English. So, in your, you know, you want to, again, be read just to recognize that you know they've been central it's just an uh, uh, a sort of slightly higher register uh, synonym of central when you hear something like a detailed analysis now this is one place where you could probably drop the adjective detailed i mean no one's going to hold it against you if you just say an analysis <coughs> of the gender related impact of the conflict uh here this expression rising to the level of persecution now if you recall for the first in the i think it was the eu statement they talked about constituting uh a crime against humanity i gave you a couple of other alternatives that you'll hear you know like amounting to being tantamount to so again this is just that same idea rising uh to the level of persecution you know pour constituer um la persecution um so that's again just another alternative English uh, expression that more or less means the same thing. Uh, these, con con these concepts, again, arbitrary imprisonment and detention, very important. Now we get here the sexual and gender-based violence. So it's like I say, the, the UN, uh, UN women, these UN organizations, will very much be using the sort of stock expressions Now, when you hear something like uh, in detention settings, okay, so you basically know that means prisons. So if you can't think of anything, I think it's perfectly acceptable if you're interpreting into your language to say in prisons across the country, or you could say in whatever the equivalent of detention facilities are. But if you're in a hurry, you know, prisons would be perfectly acceptable. Uh, similarly, in this paragraph, again, places of detentions, place of detention is again, effectively prisons. Um, we have again here sexual gender-based violence like before. Okay, so watch out for the acronym that they might use. And maybe the final thing I'd point out here, just this expression here, as per its mandate. That's quite a high register way of just saying in keeping with its mandate, consistent with its mandate. So you uh, people who are, you know, you've got interpreting from English, be aware of all those um variations on that same thing, theme that exists in English in accordance with, in keeping with, pursuant to. I, I use a lot, I use pursuant uh, to a lot. Okay, so I think we're going to stop there for today. So I've given you four statements there of, uh, of different styles of uh, English language statements from the native speakers to the bureaucratic, to the very bureaucratic, to the... Um, to the non-native speaker English mixed in, you know, with the other added challenger of um, uh, 
of the accent. I'm going to put in in the uh, description box under the video, I'm going to give you a link to all those four uh, texts that we've been through. So I advise you to, to practice them and see how you handle them and watch the vid and then hopefully some of the things that uh, some of the tips I've given you can apply them uh, in in future. Um, I thought it was just as I say interesting to see how I would approach these texts if I was having to do a, uh, a retour into another language. Okay, so well, if you've enjoyed the show, if you felt you've learned something new, please do smash the like button as ever. And also my fee for my these videos, yes, for the my little fee is just to please press the subscribe button if you like what you're seeing, like what you're, uh, you like what you're learning. Uh, please do keep following me here and on the uh, on the LinkedIn page, on the LinkedIn group. Please, please do join the LinkedIn group if you haven't done so already. It's just under the same name, the Interpretation Station. You can find me on LinkedIn under either my own name, Roland Palaret, or under the inter. Maybe just go to the, find the Interpretation Station, and I'll let you in, and I'll invite you into the group. And you can keep up with my usually daily updates, new little material I put in every day uh, on the group when, I, when I'm not posting uh, a video. Okay, as I say, I hope, uh, hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you've learned something new. Uh, and I'll see you again uh, very soon uh, with more videos coming up in all the various different languages. All that remains to be said then is that episode 80 of the Interpretation Station stands adjourned. The train is now leaving the Interpretation Station.